show you my experiences of how I've used the OE system in the past 12 months in my practice, um, not just in Barrett's esophagus, um, but also in uh, other conditions in the, in the esophagus. Um, but just to, to set the scene, um, do we need to improve? You know, do we need new endoscopes? Do we need new technologies? Um, and in the upper GI tract, I think we do. And it's evidenced by the fact that we are still missing upper GI cancers. And the mortality from esophagogastric cancer remains very, very poor. It doesn't matter whether you're in the east or the west, people are still dying a horrible and often um, quite uh, painful death from this. And this is a, a manuscript that was published in endoscopy from uh, some colleagues in the UK. And there was a meta-analysis where they looked at 10 studies, and they looked at the rate of missed cancers. So these are patients who had had a normal upper endoscopy in the previous three years. And you can see that ranging from five, in some cases, up to 25% of these patients had had a normal upper endoscopy in the previous three years. So, <clears throat> in summary, 11.3% of upper GI cancers were missed the endoscopy up to three years before. And so there is a real need to try and improve the quality of upper GI endoscopy, um, to create opportunities for early diagnosis, and ultimately, this will lead to minimally invasive endoscopic therapy. We're not here to talk about the therapy, but the advances in minimally invasive endoscopic therapy, from resection to ablation, um, continue to evolve on a year-by-year on year basis. And so has the technology and imaging. Where are we now? At our hands, we have a whole armamentarium of endoscopes, from um, near-focus endoscopes to magnification endoscopes um, to confocal endosystem microscopy, um, to laser imaging, to near-focus endoscopes. The technology that we have available in our endoscopy suites is evolving on a daily basis. We have here VLE, where you get a 3D volumetric reconstruction of the tubular esophagus. We have magnification endoscopy here. This is with the magnification scope with acetic acid. We have confocal endomicroscopy. We have laser imaging. We have filtering imaging. We have red flag technologies such as autofluorescence. This is the new BLI system. So we are in a position now that we are able to really give our patients every chance to exhibit their neoplasia. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this. Professor Kieslik showed us a very nice overview of the existing eye scan technology. This is the MagnaView scope that you will see today used by our colleagues in the endoscopy suite. And the three existing modes of surface, tone, and contrast enhancement really helped us to look at various microstructures to help delineate sampling and ultimately therapy. And now, we have the new OE system. Um, and you know, my hat goes off to the team behind the scenes. I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the, the, the unique filtering and post-processing technologies. But what we have now is a, 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 a real opportunity for in vivo diagnosis. But before I show you some nice videos, in vivo diagnosis is all about recognizing normal. And when you know what normal looks like, then abnormal becomes very, very easy. So we know that with mucosal architecture, whether it's in the colon, whether it's in the stomach, whether it's in the tubular esophagus, that normal is nice, regular, arranged architecture. And then you go through a sequence of inflammation where you can go back to regular, but then you get irregularity and you get featureless mucosa, which is in keeping with early neoplasia. We know that with microvasculature, where you get distortion first in the inflammatory phase, which again is reversible, but then it progresses to tortuosity and irregular dilated vessels, which again are in keeping with early cancer. And we know in the esophagus and the upper GI tract, which is what I'm talking about, in the esophagus, changes in the microvasculature and the intrapapillary capillary loops are indicative of a condition called ESCN, early squamous cancer, and we've heard about Barrett's esophagus already, where you get mucosal abnormalities and irregularities suggestive of neoplasia. We will see today a very nice case, and one of the live cases of a 
<coughs> patient with gastric metaplasia, and again, the same principle applies, that you get changes from metaplasia to neoplasia with subtle changes in the microvasculature and the micromucosal patterns. So this was really the first manuscript back in 2013 in the ex vivo study of 10 patients with ESCN where the three different filtering technolo technologies were used uh, and bench tested and really set the scene for where we are now with our clinical application of OE. So I'm not going to talk about Barrett's esophagus first, Professor Kieslich, just sorry to disappoint you, I'm going to talk about ESCN and squamous dysplasia, which is not a condition we see a lot of in the West, which disappoints me because I think a lot of our MDMs, we have a lot of patients with squamous cell cancer, and so it must exist there. Maybe we're just missing it, or maybe we just don't see these patients. But again, this is a very subtle change in the microvasculature. There is no mucosal abnormality like we have in Barrett's esophagus. We get changes, first from normal intrapapillary capillary loops, and you can see here, you go through the different stages, a vascular stage initially, and then with deeper cancer, you get a more vascular stage, and it's the anomalies that you see in these IPCLs that are indicative, not just of the stage of neoplasia, but also of the depth of neoplasia. So this was, um, if I could just ask you to, to play the video for me, please. Um, this is one of the, uh, the first or second week that, um, Let's get you to play the video for me, please. Nope. Yeah, there we go. So this is, I think, one of the first or second weeks that we had had uh, the, uh, the new 7010 processor. And you can see here, this is the existing iScan2. This is a patient who was referred to us um, for endoscopic therapy. And you can see here now, when we switch to the new OE system, you can see the very clear demarcation between the normal squamous mucosa, but also the abnormal squamous dysplasia, and up here in the two o'clock position, an early squamous cancer. This is mode two, where you get a slightly uh, more illuminated picture, but again, you can see the very crisp margin before, between the abnormal tissue and the, uh, the, the normal tissue. And then this is with magnification endoscopy, and this is the intrapapillary capillary loops. And I think these pictures are stunning. And every time I see these, I'm blown away. And you can see with magnification endoscopy, and this is 136 times zoom uh, with a cap, um, that you can really isolate these intrapapillary capillary loops, which are indicative of a deeper stage of neoplasia. And they become apparent here. It's almost like a mosaic pattern. So very crisp, light, sharp pictures. And this is a patient with ESCN. So if I can just ask you to play this picture for this video for me also. So this is a, a patient who was referred, uh, you can see from the date, just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, it's a patient who had a cervical squamous cell cancer, which was treated with radiotherapy. And four years on, she presented with candidiasis in the esophagus that was referred to us. And you can see just with the standard high-definition wide light endoscopy picture, things do not look quite right. And then we switch to the existing uh, iScan2, and then now again with iScan OE, you can see this very clear demarcation between the normal light green squamous mucosa and then this plaque-like structure here. And what was sampled as squamous low-grade display dysplasia, you can see here, you can see here a depressed lesion. Um, and when you use the optical enhancement that you get, you get a very clear demarcation between normal and abnormal. And Professor Inouye has described something called the metallic silver sign with narrowband imaging in patients with a deeper grade of squamous dysplasia. So you can see this with the Lugol's iodine on white light endoscopy. And this is a bit of work we've been doing with the OE system and Lugol's chroma endoscopy. If I can ask you just to freeze the picture for me there, please. And what we're beginning to see in only a handful of patients, that in dysplasia, you get this slightly pink appearance. But with some of the deeper grades of neoplasia, with iScan OE and Lugol, you get this deep red discoloration. We don't know if this means anything, and we will need to look at this in the, in the clinical context. This was resected, and this was a carcinoma in situ with an SM1 invasion, and this patient um, has been prepared for, for further chemo radiotherapy. So just to <laughs> now talk about Barrett's esophagus to finish off and also set the scene for the live cases this morning. We know that Barrett's esophagus is something that arises in response to um, obviously biological triggers, but also 
indulgence in the Western world, which leads to obesity and a gastroesophageal reflux. And we know that in patients with acid reflux, up to 15% of them will get this metaplastic change in the distal squamous esophagus. And in the majority of patients with Barrett's, it's of no consequence. They will take it to their graves. But we know that in a minority of patients, there will be this transformation, where you get a sequence of changes from non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus to various forms of neoplasia. Now we can do something about this. For the past decade, there is a wealth of data supporting minimally invasive endoscopic therapy to treat patients with Barrett's neoplasia, because progression to esophageal cancer is bad news. But we can't treat it if we don't find it. So if I can just ask you to, um, oops, sorry, to play the video. Uh, this is a case from last week, um, and our pathologist only sent me the uh, EMR specimen this morning, which I'm going to show you. So this is a patient who is five years on from radiofrequency ablation, and he presented for a follow-up endoscopy. And you can see here with the eye scan uh, that in the 9 o'clock position with the eye scan 2, you have this nice, normal, regular mucosa, and then if you just focus <clears throat> at the bit in the 12 o'clock position, it is completely featureless. So with eye scan 2, you can see that there is absolutely no surface pattern here, um, and it is completely featureless. And then when you switch to the OE mode, um, you can see this very crisp mucosal patterns here on the uh, left-hand side of your picture, indicative of metaplastic Barrett's. And then when you focus on this area in the middle of your screen, you can see these dilated vessels, but again, it highlights the fact that this is completely surfaceless um, and has no organized pattern, and this was resected, um, and this was sent through yesterday, and this was high-grade dysplasia five years after radiofrequency ablation, and we picked this up with OE. Just to finish off, if I can just ask you to play this uh, clip for me also. Uh, this was from a few weeks ago. Again, this is a patient with Barrett's esophagus, who was referred up to our unit for radiofrequency ablation. Um, and you can see, just with the standard wide light endoscopy picture in iScan 1, that there is an, a complex lesion. And when you use iScan OE, you can see that these irregular, dilated blood vessels in the center of the cancer, but also the areas of depression. And you can see with iScan OE that you are able to demarcate the lesion in a lot more detail. Um, this was uh, actually resected with a, the new captivated device, and this was a, a moderately differentiated cancer with lymphovascular evasion and an R1 um, uh, resection uh, specimen, and so the patient was referred for um, surgery. So you've seen some of the clinical applications that I've been able to use uh, iScan OE in my practice, and just to, to finish, um, uh, uh, helmet uh, is always a step ahead when it comes to uh, uh, arranging fantastic clinical studies, and this is a really nice abstract which is going to be presented um, next week in San Diego. Um, and, and Helmut and his group in Erlang looked at patients, consecutive patients with acid reflux, um, and they examined the distal esophagus with white light endoscopy, then also with eye scan OE. Um, and they compared the features seen in the patients with reflux compared to the controls. <coughs> Excuse me. And very nicely, they showed that in patients with symptoms in, of gastroesophageal reflux, they had uh, derangement in their intrapapillary capillary loops uh, with tortuosity, dilatation, but also the increased numbers of IPCL in the patients with reflux compared to the controls. So very nice, elegant little study which shows that the introduction of the new OE technology has significantly improved the diagnosis of patients with reflux compared to just high-definition standard wild light endoscopy. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Professor Kiesley, Professor Devia, just to summarize, um, what are the perceived benefits of OE in the upper GI tract? Um, the images are very crisp and very sharp from the videos that you've seen. It's a brighter, uh, more illuminated picture compared to some of the rival filtering technologies. Uh, you don't lose out on the mucosal characterization. It's purely for vessel characterization, I agree, but you still get the mucosal delineation that you need. With magnification endoscopy in the correct hand, you get excellent um, detail about microvasculature, especially in patients with ESCN and early squamous cancer. Um, and now we're in a position that we have this technology in our hands to look at targeted multi-center trials to guide users to the best practice moving forward. Thank you very much.